This is the second year that we're using a virtual format and we're delighted to see so many of you, um, over 200 have joined so far, I see. The role of directors, board oversight committee members, volunteers, management and staff, together with the loyalty of credit union members, are important and differentiating features of credit unions. I note also the annual CXI report results published earlier today with credit unions number one for the seventh year in a row and indeed the only brand to have maintained constant presence in the top 10 since that survey began. Your experience and commitment is a vital component in ensuring that credit unions maintain develop and grow sustainable businesses into the future in order to serve and protect your members' needs and savings. We recognise that this is a particularly busy time of the year at your credit unions, given the 30th of September year end. We want to acknowledge your work and cooperation last year in ensuring that the 2020 year end process worked well, recognising that it was a very different and challenging year for all including in the ways of working and format of engagement. Our staff in the registry are committed to working with you over the coming period in order to ensure a smooth, efficient and professional process for the 2021 year end. More broadly on engagement, the registry is committed to clear and transparent communications. And these information seminars are one part of our overall engagement and communication strategy. Others include our regular publications, such as thematic reviews and supervisory commentary, the financial conditions of credit union statistical series, and the credit union newsletter, all of which are intended to support and inform you on a range of supervisory and policy areas as you undertake your credit union roles. Now, turning to the information seminar for this evening, each year we seek to include presentations on a range of topical matters, including new items. In terms of the agenda, a number of my colleagues in the Registry of Credit Unions will present, <laughs> some of whom you may know from previous years, and we also have some new faces. From the Registry, we have Anna Marie Finnegan, Mark Ward, Wendy Kearns, John Marr, Kay Keenan, and David Keelty. We're joined by a colleague, Raquel Diaz, from the Statistics Division of the Central Bank. The four sections that are on the agenda for this evening are as follows. Firstly, Anna Marie will present on credit union investments based on our recently published report on analysis of investments. Secondly, Raquel Diaz, from the Statistics Division will present on the key features of an upcoming ECB regulation on payment statistics. Thirdly, Mark Ward will present on a range of regulatory updates covering individual accountability framework, risk management thematic review, and 2021 year end. And Wendy Cairns will cover transfers of engagement. Finally, the fourth area, uh, Kay Keenan will provide an update on MPCAS applications and John Marr will present on credit union lending, providing an overview of recent trends. The presentations will be followed by a Q&A session, which will be facilitated by David Keelty. And in that regard, questions can be inserted in the chat box. Also, if you do have any follow up questions on any of the topics covered here this evening, um, after you've had um, a chance uh, to uh, consider the matters, please do feel free to contact our office by email and we will respond. The full session, including the Q&A, will take about an hour and 15 minutes, so we will finish up by 6.30 p.m. Um, as you will have noted from earlier, we are recording the presentations. Um, that does not include the Q&A session. And those, these presentations will be made available on our website in due course. Copies of the presentations will also be put on our website and a link will be provided to your credit union. 
In this regard, I want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues in enabling the supporting arrangements and set up for the session this evening, in particular, Anna Marie Finnegan, Jennifer Inglis, and Vicky Dimitrova Brennan. So at this stage now, I'll hand over to Anna Marie for the first of the presentations on credit union investments. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine, uh, and good evening, everyone. Uh, just, I suppose, a little reminder, just in terms of if anybody wants to uh, turn off their video before we uh, start uh, the presentations. Uh, so I'm going to kick off the uh, presentations this evening uh, with a short presentation on credit union investments. And this is going to focus on our recently published report, uh, which was based on analysis we undertook on credit union investments. So I'm going to give you a, a quick bit of background on the investment framework for credit unions, uh, and then going to give some background on the, the format of the report, uh, then highlight some of the key themes and trends that were identified in our analysis, uh, take you through the conclusions of the report and then finally finish up with some of the supervisory expectations uh, that we outlined in the report. Uh, Jennifer, you can just hit the next slide there. <laughs> Uh, so I suppose before we talk about investments at all, I think it's just important to recap on the investment framework uh, for credit unions. And I suppose the statutory provisions relating to credit union investments are set out in section 43 of the 97 Act. And more specifically, section 43.1 of the 97 Act uh, includes a requirement that credit unions need to ensure that investments that they undertake do not involve undue risk uh, to member savings. And I suppose that's the key factor that needs to underpin all investments. Uh, in terms of the central bank's role, uh, section 43.3 of the 97 Act provides the central bank with uh, regulation making powers. Uh, and we first made uh, investment regulations back in 2016. Uh, and these include uh, prescribing the list of permissible investments for credit unions. Uh, and obviously in prescribing and setting investment requirements, uh, we're very much informed by our own statutory ma mandate as it relates to the protection of members funds. And also that key provision uh, that I mentioned at, at the top of the slide. So since we introduced the regulations in uh, 2016, there has been two, uh, I suppose, significant changes made uh, to the investment uh, regulations. The first followed a, a detailed review in 2017. So in March 2018, we introduced three new investment uh, classes for credit unions, and they were supranational bonds, corporate bonds, and investments in tier three approved housing bodies. Uh, there were some additional changes made to uh, the requirements or the regulations uh, in December last year. Uh, the first was the introduction of a transitional arrangement, which was to facilitate the holding of investments in UK credit institutions. Uh, and these investments would have become uh, non-compliant uh, post-Brexit without the introduction of that, that uh, arrangement. And the second change was to formally expand the definition of liquid assets uh, to include excess balances in the minimum reserve account. So I'm now going to move to the next slide. And this just provides a bit of background on the report itself. So the report uh, was published on the 15th of September uh, and it's available on the uh, central bank website. Uh, the purpose of the report was to set out analysis that we'd undertaken to assess the impact of the changes that were introduced in 2018 to uh, the investment regs and also to set out our supervisory expectations for credit unions in relation to investment. So the report provides um, an overview of uh, the analysis uh, that was undertaken. So the review period was March 2018 uh, up until September 2020. And the uh, analysis itself was uh, informed by both prudential return data uh, provided by credit unions and also by responses to the investment questionnaire, our investment template that we issued in September 2020. Uh, so the report highlights a number of themes uh, and trends uh, and also uh, takes a look at the utilization of those new investment classes that were introduced uh, in 2018. 
Uh, so I'm now just going to take you through uh, on the next number of slides some of those key uh, trends uh, and themes that are identified. Uh, and of course, there's a bit more detail on all of these in the report itself. So firstly, looking at total investments. So I suppose the key message here is the increase in total investments. So they've grown by a billion uh, over the review period from 12 billion to 13 billion. Uh, and that's a reflection of savings inflows and the low uh, sector loan to asset ratio. And this means that investment represent a very significant proportion of overall assets. So they stood at 67% of assets as at the 30th of September uh, 2020. So moving now uh, to look at the investment classes. Um, so I suppose the first comment I'd make there is that the analysis showed that credit unions have continued to focus on traditional investment classes. Uh, and I suppose what we mean there is there's still a very high weighting uh, to accounts in authorised credit institutions or deposit accounts. So about 74% of investments uh, were held in those accounts at the end of September. Uh, I suppose one trend we did notice is there's slightly higher weighting for smaller credit unions. So credit unions with assets of less than 40 million have about 80% in accounts and authorised credit institutions and that would uh, compare uh, with a figure of about 72% for larger credit unions or credit unions with assets of over uh, 100 million. Uh, also interesting to note uh, the data we got on the questionnaire just told us a little bit more about the makeup of those deposits. So heavily weighted towards traditional deposits. So about 87% uh, weighted uh, to uh, traditional deposits which is 13% in uh, tracker style products. So I'm going to move now to the next slide, which looks at bank bonds um, and Irish and EEA state securities or government bonds, as, as we sometimes refer to them as. So bank bonds are the next most significant uh, investment category. They represent about 17 percent uh, of investments as of the 30th of September. Uh, and Irish and EEA state uh, securities represented about 5 percent uh, and no significant change actually in, in the weightings to those two uh, categories. Uh, so that brings me then to the next slide, uh, which uh, focuses on the new investment classes. Uh, so overall, the analysis demonstrated uh, limited uh, to no investment in, in the no new investment classes. So uh, there was no investments reported in tier three approved housing bodies and very small weightings to supranational and corporate bonds. So I think in terms of approved housing bodies, I think it's taken time to establish a, a vehicle to facilitate uh, that type of investment. But we are now aware uh, that work on establishing structure has been progressed uh, and there are available options uh, for credit unions to make uh, those types of investments. In terms of supranational and corporate bonds, it would seem that uh, the low interest rate environment is a factor here. Uh, and I suppose the fact that there is limited additional return uh, for those investment classes versus some of the more traditional uh, investment categories that credit unions focus on. Uh, so I think that certainly has been a factor there. Uh, in terms of corporate bonds, we also noted that there hadn't been investment via a usage uh, structure. Uh, but again, here we have been aware of some development since the analysis period completed. So uh, we're aware that uh, a fund has been established and has now met the 150 million uh, size threshold. Uh, and again, that provides uh, another, uh, I suppose, vehicle uh, to invest in, in, in corporate bonds. So. That brings me to the next slide. So I'm going to move beyond the asset classes now and just highlight some other trends relating to uh, both maturity profile and counterparty. So starting with maturity profile, and I suppose the key trend here is a significant shift longer in the maturity profile of investments. Uh, so if we look at investments over five years in maturity, that has increased from 16% of investments in uh, 2018 up to 31% uh, in 2020. And likewise, we've seen a significant shift uh, lower in terms of weightings to uh, shorter term investments. So investments with less than one year uh, to maturity have decreased from 42% uh, to 28% uh, over uh, the same period. And this is, a, I suppose, a theme I'll come back to when I uh, focus in on the supervisory uh, 
expectations uh, at the end of the presentation. So moving quickly then to uh, counterparties and a couple of observations there. Uh, I think the first point I'd make is that the analysis demonstrated that there was a wide range of counterparties available. So over 70 counterparties were identified uh, on the data provided on uh, the questionnaire. Uh, but we do still see some level uh, of concentration across a relatively small number of counterparties. But interestingly, the makeup of uh, the top five counterparties has actually changed. Uh, and this was something that we had also flagged on the financial conditions last year. Uh, and while we see some level of concentration, there has been a reduction in the overall level of concentration across counterparties. So if we look at 2018, uh, at that stage, 62% of investments were held across the top five counterparties. That's now fallen back towards 56%. So I'll move then to the next slide. Uh, and this just gives an overview of the key conclusions of the report. Uh, so I suppose the first point there is around the analysis on the new or the utilization of the new uh, investment car car uh, categories. Uh, and I suppose we do note uh, the limit impact of the introduction of those uh, new uh, categories to date. But as I've mentioned on the earlier slide, I think there are developments uh, that would suggest that that may change if credit unions choose uh, to utilize those, those investment classes uh, going forward. And that's something we'll continuing to monitor. Uh, but I suppose the key overriding message of the report is that having undertaken the analysis and consideration, uh, we remain of the view that the existing uh, investment classes uh, and requirements as set out in the 2016 uh, relations, uh, regulations remain appropriate and they, they do provide an appropriate range uh, and an appropriate opportunity for diversification uh, to credit unions. Of course, taking account of uh, you know, the need for conservatism uh, in investment portfolios, which is very much tied back to that requirement under Section 43 of the 97 Act. So just very quickly before I conclude, uh, I just want to take you through uh, some of the supervisory expectations that are set out in the report itself. Um, and I suppose the key point here is in undertaking the analysis, uh, you know, there was two key trends that sort of jumped out, that increase in maturity and the change uh, in some of the counterparties was suggested of some change in risk appetite, uh, which I think may be driven by the low interest rate environment and a desire to try and enhance yield. Uh, but I think the key message there is that uh, notwithstanding the low interest rate environment, uh, you know, the risk profile of investment portfolios needs to uh, remain appropriate. Uh, and the overall consideration, as I've highlighted on the bottom of the slide there, still needs to be the protection by credit unions of the funds of their members. So I think it's just an opportunity to reiterate that message. And the next slide, I'm not going to go through it uh, in full detail, but it highlights, I suppose, you know, how how that can be achieved. And I think we're stressing here that the investment decision making process is is really important. Uh, and I suppose the overall key message here is that, you know, for every investment decision, there needs to be careful consideration uh, given, uh, you know, credit unions need to ensure that they understand the risk profile of the investment itself. Uh, and that they're comfortable that it aligns uh, with their own risk appetite and indeed uh, I suppose the risk appetite as prescribed within in the 97 Act and within our own uh, regulations. So that brings me to the end of uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, if people have questions, uh, they can put them in the chat function and we'll come to them at the end. Uh, so I'm now going to hand over to my uh, colleague uh, Raquel. Thanks very much. Excuse me, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Anna Marie. Um, so uh, this will be a high level uh, presentation on the upcoming ECB regulation on payment statistics. Um, this was published uh, in December 2020 on the ECB website uh, and it will be uh, applicable from 2022. Uh, we have had a few engagements in relation to this, so this may not be new to you. Um, and going just to the next slide, please. So we'll be uh, we'll have a brief 
uh, look at the reasons why we are updating uh, the regulation. Why is this necessary? Really, uh, we'll look at the major changes in comparison to the current ECB pay stats regulation. Uh, we'll look at the derogations, uh, and uh, last but not least, we'll look at the supporting documentation that is available and the upcoming events we have planned in relation to this. Uh, so the payment statistics are necessary to provide an harmonized and comparable information on payments uh, and payment systems in the EU. Uh, this is actually uh, not entirely new uh, as data on payments is collected actually since 2007 and it's currently based on the ECB regulation addressed to payment service providers and to payment service providers operators resident in the euro area so obviously this includes credit union this includes credit unions uh, as data is collected uh, from credit unions since 2014 under the current regulation uh, in addition to the ecb requirements uh, the eba has a separate psd2 fraud collection um, and this actually aims at monitoring the fraudulent payment transactions and the efficiency of the fraud prevention mechanisms this data is then used uh, for analysis of policy questions and to conduct of oversight um, of payments instruments and systems. In addition, obviously, we aim at providing information to the general public and to the market participants. So if we move then to the next slide, um, you know, while we just saw um, that this is not entirely new, uh, and that the collection of pay stats has been something recurrent, um, and that is obviously not new to you either. Uh, new developments in the payments area uh, made necessary to update the existing regulation. So on one side, uh, we have the re retail payments evolving rapidly. So we have the instant payments, we have mobile wallets, contactless payments, cards, and mobile P2P, for example. On the other side, uh, we have new user requirements that we need to consider. So we have the need to monitor cross-border trade and domestic activity. We have the need for higher frequency and more timely data. We have a focus on granularity, and we have also a lot of interest on the merchant category codes. So, so these are all reasons why there was a need to update the existing regulation. So if we go then to the next slide, we'll be able to see, so what is actually changing then with the new regulation? So, currently, we collect the annual payment statistics return that is due in by end of March for non-derogated institutions. So, this gives us a T plus three months um, submission period. So, as part of the of the current of the upcoming regulation, uh, data will be collected on a quarterly basis, and rather than the three months, we'll have twenty working days for non-derogated uh, institutions. Then, if we look at the semi-annual requirements we have at the moment, this will apply only to the fraudulent uh, data, uh, so the data collected under PSD2. And again, it's at a T plus three months. So, under the upcoming regulation, we'll be actually collecting data on a semi-annual basis, both for payments and fraud. And rather than collecting, collecting it at a T plus three months, we'll be collecting it at T plus two. And this will apply for both the reduced reporting reporters that we'll be talking about in a minute and the full reporter. So applies to all PSPs and PSOs resident in Ireland. Now, and this is what I find to be the key uh, point here really is that while we collect data at the moment for in Excel for both returns, we have the PSA, the annual return and the fraud return. Uh, we have to take into consideration that as part of the upcoming regulation, we'll be moving from collecting around 1,800 data points on an annual basis to be collecting 700,000 data points on a semi-annual basis for full reporters. So we'll see in a minute the reason behind the increase, but it's really important to note that uh, continuing to use the same uh, solutions really wasn't an option due to the volume of data points. Uh, and that for that reason, an Excel template will no longer be available. And that will then rather be collecting data at this point in XML. The reporting instructions are actually available at the moment on the central bank website. And for anyone opening the reporting instructions, uh, it will become very clear that this is a very challenging regulation from a technical perspective. Uh, and that while we can really support in terms of getting the data into the central bank, you may need to communicate with your partners to find a solution that suits your organization in terms of uh, getting the XML files ready. The XML file and the XML transmission really was uh, the best way we could find a balance between having an approach that would be too technical or too manual. Uh, so this was the best balance we could find. 
In terms of good news, what won't change is the submission channel. So we'll be continuing to use ONR for the purpose of submitting the data. And then if you take me to the next slide, please. So um, I referred uh, just in a minute, uh, a minute ago to the increase in terms of data points. So why are the data points increasing in relation to what we are collecting at the moment? So they are increasing because we are collecting data on initiation channels. Uh, so P2P mobile payments, uh, instant payments, all of this new detail has to be collected. Then we are collecting data on fraud and related data. So you remember I said a few minutes ago that we have at the moment two different returns. So we have the fraud return and the payment statistics annual return. This will be basically brought into one and we'll have now a single data flow uh, and we also have a methodological alignment. So we'll only have one return uh, and one regulation. Uh, so, in terms of the quarterly data, this is very important for balance of payments uh, and hence the need for further geographic coverage and for detail on the MCC codes. As mentioned, we'll be enhancing the frequency of data collection. So, we'll be collecting data on a quarterly and semi-annual basis and enhancement of geo breakdown. So, we'll have uh, information and require information on an individual country breakdown basis. In addition, the timeliness, uh, we'll, we have enhanced the timeliness in the sense that previously we'd be collecting data on a T plus three months uh, and now we'll be on a T plus two and at a T plus 20 working days for the quarterly requirements. So if we could just go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the derogations um, from full reporting, uh, so, as I mentioned, not all institutions will be required to submit data on a quarterly basis. Uh, DCB regulation actually allows uh, smaller institutions within a threshold to provide a reduced reporting uh, at national discretion. Uh, so, the important thing here to mention is that uh, there is no uh, absence from reporting. There will be an increase in reporting. There is the need to report data always on a semi-annual basis. Uh, the quarterly uh, requirement is the one that uh, may or may not apply to your institution. Uh, the CB, uh, so the CBI actually uh, has been used derogation since 2019, uh, and we decided to ring fence and maximize the use of derogations uh, to the credit union sector. The list actually of institutions granted the derogation is actually available on the central bank website, and this list will be reviewed in 2023. After we received the first year of data under the new regulation. Therefore, there is no need to apply for a derogation as we will be continuing to maximize the use of this when possible. Just to reiterate that these are the derogations grant a reduced reporter, but that the volume of data points is still much larger than the one currently um, under the current re regulation. So it will still be a challenge, um, technically speaking, for the derogated institutions. Uh, and just going to the next slide, please. So, last but not least, uh, we are very much aware that, as mentioning, this is a uh, very <laughs> challenging uh, regulation in terms of te the technical aspects of it. Uh, so, we have had a good a few events and communication uh, in the past year. So, we had our first industry uh, event on the 8th February. We had our second event on the 27th July. Uh, and we plan uh, on having further engagements and we are planning to have a uh, few meetings with the rep bodies in the in the coming uh, weeks. In terms of supporting documentation, uh, there is a good few, um, there are a lot of documents and support on the central bank website dedicated page. So you have the FAQs, you have the ECB manual, which is the, in terms of methodology, the go-to manual. Uh, we have all the industry events slide decks are available there. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the reduced reporters list available there as well, and the reporting instructions pack as well. If there's any feedback or suggestions that you'd like to send us, uh, please free, free, feel free to contact us on paystats at centralbank.ie. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Um, and good evening all. Um, so, as uh, Elaine had indicated in her opening address, uh, Wendy and myself will be going through some uh, regulatory updates. So, there are three topics that I will be updating on, namely uh, the risk management maturity thematic review, the individual accountability framework, and finally, I will go over some important uh, considerations for the 2021 year-end process. 
So first up is the risk management maturity thematic review. So as some of you may know, uh, the registry have been undertaking this thematic review in the area of risk management maturity over the past few months. Um, I think it's been evident uh, from our supervisory work in prior years that greater ownership of risk management um, by boards of directors of credit unions um, really is critical uh, to overcoming and addressing the reoccurring uh, risk issues uh, that were being identified uh, over and over again. So uh, this, this has been highlighted in our recent publications and most recently in the 2020 uh, PRISM supervisory commentary. So uh, in light of this, um, the risk management maturity thematic review was undertaken uh, with the with kind of two key objectives really to to assess compliance with the the, the relevant legal and regulatory framework uh, requirements excuse me uh, on risk management and then also just to observe and identify actions and processes um in the sample of credit unions um that those credit unions were taking to to foster um a culture of risk management and to to really embed uh, risk management into the day-to-day -day operations so uh, you know in some ways it was not only assessing if credit unions were meeting these applicable regulatory requirements, but how they were doing it, you know, and what good practice, practices are in place um, to meet those requirements. And um, so just if we move on to the next slide, so just to go over a little bit about the methodology of our review. <clears throat> so there were 12 credit unions selected as part of the review um, and the sample selected provided a, a, you know, a mix of different asset sizes, urban and rural locations, there was a mix of in, internal and outsourced uh, risk management functions um, and also a, a mix of industrial and community based credit unions so that we had a, a wide variety uh, across our sample. Um, the review really focused on, on four key areas of, of risk management and we wanted to ensure that we were getting, you know, the, the, those main pillars um, of the credit union and those main pillar functions throughout the credit union. So um, I suppose most importantly, really about board over, over, uh, over ownership and oversight, excuse me. Um, and really just to see what boards were doing in relation to the, the ownership and the oversight of everything in, uh, to do with risk management. And um, we also looked at the risk management function. So the structure and the frame, uh, the, the structure and the framework, uh, just really to see uh, how credit unions were doing uh, on the fundamentals and, and the real kind of baseline uh, documentation in relation to risk management. Uh, thirdly, we looked at risk management reporting, um, I suppose really just to, to see, I suppose the quality of reporting um, and to see really the life cycle of uh, the risk management report um, from it being put together to it being reviewed um, and it being dealt with by the board. And then lastly, it was really around training and culture. And, and this was this really went to the heart of how credit unions were, you know, pushing that culture and embedding that culture of risk management uh, out across um, the whole of the credit union. So <clears throat> just to give you a kind of, um, a run about how we went about this. So in May uh, of this year, uh, an information request uh, requesting a wide range of documentation was sent to all 12 credit unions in the sample. And then following submission of the uh, of uh, that information and uh, the, the team's review of that documentation, we held interviews with all 12 credit unions, uh, held three, three uh, separate interviews um, with the, the um, manager, uh, the, the risk management officer and the board of all uh, 12 credit unions. So 36 um, separate interviews uh, across the sample. Um, and then just to move on to the next slide, please. Um, so just to give you, I suppose, next steps in, in, in uh, we're, we're very nearly there in, in relation to this review. Um, we have been, you know, since we've held our interviews and, and reviewed the documentation, we have uh, been collating and I suppose um, reviewing uh, our findings and uh, we're very close to uh, finalizing our report. So as you can see there with the, the review timeline, um, obviously May was our kind of our starting point with sending out the information and we hope then to uh, publish a report over the next couple of weeks um, in November uh, 2021. Um, so I think, look, at this point, just uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of the credit unions that were involved in the sample. Um, uh, you know, each of the credit unions were very accommodating in, you know, scheduling um, of interviews and sending documentation into us. And obviously, uh, the difficult circumstances we find ourselves in with the with the pandemic and, and doing everything virtually and um, everything ran uh, very smoothly. And um, all of the credit unions were um, were very accommodating in that respect. So, again, just a thank you 
um, to all of them for that. And, and hopefully there will be many useful takeaways for all credit unions in the sector once you've had a chance to digest uh, all of the findings and the recommendations in the report. Okay, so just to move on, and I think just to continue with the theme of culture, um, uh, you know, in most recent years, there has been an increased focus uh, nationally and internationally on strengthening corporate culture, uh, driving positive behaviour and increasing individual accountability to mitigate conduct risk, uh, you know, and a pre a prevent issues arising within firms. And uh, just to talk about the individual accountability framework, which was published uh, on the 27th of July, 2021. So the four key components, um, just to touch on them briefly. So the senior executive accountability regime will require firms to set out clearly and comprehensively where responsibility and decision making lie in order to achieve transparency as to who is accountable for what within firms. Um, the enforceable conduct standards will set out behaviour expected uh, of firms and their staff, uh, including obligations to conduct themselves with honesty and integrity and to act with due skill, care, diligence in the best uh, interest of all consumers. Um, Thirdly, the central bank's fitness and probity regime uh, will be enhanced and will place greater onus on firms to proactively certify that certain staff are fit and proper and capable of performing the roles with integrity and comp uh, competence. And then finally, the central bank's administrative sanctions procedure will be strengthened to ensure uh, that inv uh, individuals can be uh, pursued directly for their misconduct uh, rather than only where they uh, participated in uh, a firm's wrong wrongdoing. So the reforms will also provide greater process efficiency, clarity, administrative consistency to all involved, uh, including those who may be subject uh, to an enforcement action and a continued focus by the central bank on proportionality and fair procedures, you know, is a, is a real key theme of the individual accountability framework proposals. Um, and just to move on to the next slide, this really is just to touch on the scope um, of this. OK, so the senior executive accountability regime, which was the first component outlined on the previous slide, will not initially apply to credit unions um, along with other sectors, uh, not in scope initially, uh, but may be brought within scope uh, in the future after the legislation is enacted. Um, and, and, and while that will not initially apply to credit unions, there will be contact standards which will apply to credit unions, as you can see listed there. Um, um, and, and just finally to say credit unions will also be within scope uh, of proposed changes to the FMP and the administrative sanctions procedures. So <clears throat> I think our next steps on this really is that once the bill, uh, the bill has been enacted, um, the central bank intends to publicly consult on the implementation of um, the individual accountability framework. And um, just on that, anybody that would like any more information on the, uh, on the individual accountability framework can find that on the central bank website. And then finally, um, just to touch uh, briefly on a couple of key messages with regards to the 2021 financial year end. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, you know, it's important to reflect and acknowledge the current macroeconomic environment. Um, and I know we certainly don't need to labor the points on this slide, um, as I, I think everybody on this call is acutely aware um, of the difficulties of the current economic climate and, and the challenges it brings. Um, and I think notwithstanding the, the, the widespread uh, vaccination program in Ireland, um, which has somewhat reduced uncertainty and the downside risks to, uh, to, to the macrofinancial outlook, um, I think the recent surge in cases over the past week or so really does just remind us um, of the uncertainty and volatility that, uh, that this pandemic can bring. Um, so really, you know, and, and the full extent of borrower financial distress is likely to only become apparent um, uh, as we make our way out of this and, and government support start to unwind. So I think all of those factors, um, as we can see there, look, all of our, those factors uh, exas uh, exacerbate the risks and challenges for credit unions, you know, which which only goes to heighten the well-documented sustainability uh, challenges that um, are already faced by many, many credit unions. So I think with that said, um, if we just move on to um, the next slide, just to finally say, like in light of, in light of all of that, um, just some important considerations in relation to the, the, the 2021 financial year end. Um, I think, you know, first of all, I would say um, credit unions in preparing their 2021 account should take all uh, account of all the matters set out in, in the circular, uh, the 2021 financial year end circular, which was um, which was sent out on the 7th of September 2021. Um, I think all boards of directors need to ca carefully consider um, the adequacy of loan provisions and other asset impairments 
uh, and prudent reserve management in 2021, given the the, the, the economic uh, outlook that, that, that we're currently faced with. Um, I, I think you know a key aspect of the 2021 year end process should be informed identification and consideration of the key risks arising from uh, COVID and Brexit. Um, and then just to say, really, um, if credit unions should contact our supervisor and, and, and communicate closely with uh, with your supervisor uh, where you are considering distributions, um, setting out rationale, how the proposal you know demonstrate prudent, forward-looking capital reserve management. Um, and then lastly, just to say, in the circular of the 25th of February 2021, we did recommend that credit unions pass a rule amendment at their 2020 AGM to ensure uh, that they'd have had the option uh, to hold virtual general meetings beyond the interim period, which which did end on the 30th of June. So again, just to say where credit unions do plan to hold a virtual AD, a AGM, they do need to ensure that they pass such a rule amendment and that this rule amendment has been registered by the central bank. So uh, that's it from me. Um, I'm now just going to hand over to Wendy Kearns, um, who will be given a, an update on restructuring. And if there's any questions on what we've gone through, we will have a QA. and a Just to remind you that we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Mark. Um, a very good evening to everyone. Um, by way of just brief introduction, uh, my name is Wendy Kearns. I am part of the intervention and restructuring team within RCU. Uh, this evening, I'll just be sharing some context and some information on credit union restructuring in 2021, providing some overall context and, and detail on some of the trends and motivating factors we've seen feature as part of TOE activity this year. So firstly, uh, just to look briefly at the profile of restructuring to date in 2021. So in the year to September 2021, RCU have successfully completed 12 transfers of engagements with transfer E asset sizes ranging from 49 to 387 million and transfer or asset sizes ranging from 56 then to less than a million. So the registry has really seen a very broad range in total asset sizes of credit unions involved, uh, as well as a very diverse risk profile uh, for each of the respective TOE projects. Uh, we do anticipate a small number of additional TOE projects um, being finalized before the end of the 2021 calendar year. And of course, we'll continue to engage your credit, credit unions considering TOE activity during uh, 2022. So looking in slightly more detail at the motivating factors for credit unions to engage uh, in, in a transfer of engagement. Uh, the first one we look at is around governance frameworks. Uh, so our experience has shown that credit unions seeking a more mature, established, kind of robust governance framework have used the TOE as a way to achieve this objective. Uh, it's also a method of addressing specific governance weaknesses within individual credit unions. Uh, really through the kind of combination of skill sets of the combined management uh, and the volunteer structure. Um, another kind of motivating factor we've seen is, is around financial synergies. Uh, so look, many credit unions continue to experience a high cost to income ratio. Uh, this continues to represent a challenge to the sustainability of the sector. Um, cost related benefits can be achieved through restructuring opportunities. So for example, by the uh, elimination of duplicate costs and more efficient uh, operational practices. Uh, we're aware that a TOE process can represent a significant kind of cost outlay. Uh, however, we would make two points uh, in relation to this one. So firstly, our experience has shown that the initial upfront cost can be recouped and exceeded uh, by savings in the medium term. And then secondly, and, and where possible, RCU will work with credit unions involved to ensure that the cost can be minimized through tailoring the requirements uh, of the TOE process. So overall, uh, restructuring does continue to provide a way for credit unions to realize cost savings and allowing them to really achieve uh, more efficient economies of scale. Uh, another op uh, motivational uh, factor has been around operation, operational resilience. Uh, so again, credit unions have experienced an increase in their operational risk profile, uh, partly due to the reliance on increasingly complex IT systems and outsourced service providers uh, to conduct their business. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 uh, ha has played its part uh, and has also increased operational uh, risks as well. So the ability to really maintain pace with this rate of change um, has been a motivating factor for some credit unions uh, seeking a, a restructuring solution. 
Um, so then moving over, if we just look then and some examples of the solutions um, that we've seen that restructuring has provided to secure long term access uh, to, to credit union services. So the first one is around the viability. Um, so look, we continue to see examples of restructuring addressing immediate financial viability concerns in a number of credit unions uh, trending towards the minimum regulatory reserve requirement. Um, and in these cases, restructuring has provided um, you know, a more stable and secure financial position into the future. It's also ensured the provision of credit union services uh, to its members and really avoiding the need for, for more intensive regulatory engagement. Um, solutions around governance, so restructuring has again provided an appropriate and timely solution where some credit unions are experiencing significant weaknesses uh, in their government uh, governance frameworks um, at managerial and or at board level. So like for example a recent uh, restructuring case completed by the INR team involved a transfer or credit union that had a weakened uh, financial position but this credit union was also operating with a temporary management structure um, in place so really offering very limited stability uh, in the short term. So the ability to identify uh, a suitable transfer E with an enhanced and, and established management structure ensured a, a timely restructuring uh, solution for, for this credit union. Um, another solution we're seeing as well is around operational uh, frameworks. So the restructuring process does provide a comprehensive overview uh, of operational risks present in each credit union. And through the actual TOE process, a HR and a legal due diligence is undertaken. And these reports really offer a uh, greater insight into potential operational issues. So for example, you know, around maybe resource capacities. And as part of detailed remediation plans, restructuring really ensures that these weaknesses are addressed uh, in a timely and structured man manner. Uh, and there's always appropriate follow up on these also uh, where required. So just continuing on then on looking at uh, RCU engagement. Uh, so obviously RCU will continue to work with credit unions to advance suitable TOE solutions. Uh, the Registry of Credit Union encourages credit unions to give consideration to future transfer of engagement activity uh, by acting as either the transfer or, or the transfer E and really assess whether this may deliver on the wider strategic objectives uh, of their credit unions. RCU will assist any credit unions explore such, such options uh, as part of a restructuring solution. Uh, the INR team have extensive experience uh, of the restructuring process and is really willing to support credit unions that are thinking of embarking um, on this process. So if your credit union is considering activity uh, in this area and requires further information, there's a number of guidance documents available on the Central Bank website. Alternatively, if you want to speak to myself or my colleague James, uh, we're more than happy to take your call and address any questions um, that you may have. So finally, uh, and just to conclude, uh, I'm sure you're aware it's International Credit Union Day falls this week. I think it's Thursday. Uh, and the team of which is building financial health for a brighter tomorrow. And I really think that this ties in um, with what we do, because ultimately it, it is the objective that we seek to deliver in all of our uh, transfer of engagements. So I will say thank you very much for your time uh, this evening. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I will hand across to my colleague uh, Kay Keenan. Thanks guys. Thanks Wendy. Um, uh, my name is Kay Keenan. I work on the policy team and I'm just going to give a brief overview of uh, one of our additional services, MPCAS. So just go to the next slide. Yes, thanks. Um, so credit unions can apply to the central bank to provide additional services in accordance with sections 48 to 52 of the Credit Union Act 1977. And one such additional service is the member personal current account service known as MPCAS. So our application form and the application process guidelines and our website, they set out the three stages in the application process. Uh, the first of which is the eligibility assessment and our response uh, to this is to issue a minded to or a not minded to consider uh, formal uh, uh, to consider the formal application. The application assessment stage then is where we may request additional information um, and the outcome of that is that we would issue a minded to approve letter or a minded not to approve setting out the reasons why. 
and then the application approval is subject to a satisfactory response to the minded to approve letter we may issue a grant of approval letter with conditions and requirements to the credit union and any grant of approval for an additional service requires the credit union's ongoing compliance with the conditions and requirements Subsequently, the credit union must notify the bank in writing of its operational readiness to provide MPCAS at least one month before it intends making such service available to its members. And it's also required to confirm to the bank that the risk management expectations have been met and implemented, and it must attest to that prior to launching the service. And MPCAS applications must be submitted as request changes via the central bank portal. So just moving on. Um, so, uh, two key considerations uh, for that for approval of this additional service. So, we're essentially concerned with the protection of member funds. So, providing the service shouldn't put the credit union at material financial risk. Uh, the credit union should have the necessary competencies and capabilities to oversee, assess, monitor, manage, and mitigate risks incurred in providing the service. And the areas that we assess are include the credit union's PRISM risk profile, uh, any existing RMPs. We look at the impact of any recent material events. We consider the balance sheets, the financial model, the credit union's operation model, and their business model. Um, we are seeing more applications from smaller size credit unions. And essentially here, we're referring to both asset size and membership numbers. So sustainability, costs, strategy, resources, these are all issues for credit unions to consider before embarking on applying for MPCAS approval. And the, uh, we would say the extent of the fixed cost associated with the service, it can be difficult for smaller sized entities to absorb. And in addition, the service could potentially divert resources from other business lines in such smaller sized entities, coupled with the fact that a narrow common bond could prove difficult for smaller entities to develop the service. So we would encourage early engagement with the registry and we would encourage um, credit unions to contact their supervisor in advance of submitting an application. So just to finish with some statistics on the next slide, thank you. Um, so here you can see uh, the number of MPCAS approvals to date each year is from 2016 to 2021. Uh, so there have been 63 approvals issued and we have eight applications in progress at the moment. So thanks very much. And now I'll hand you over to my colleague, John. Uh, thanks a lot, Kay. Um, hi, my name is John Marr. Um, I work with the policy and regulatory approvals team, um, but I've previously also done quite a bit of work on the credit union lending model and uh, worked in areas around longer term lending and um around uh, house lending and that previously so um we thought uh, today would be a good opportunity to uh, give you some insight into how the market for uh, consumer lending has behaved uh, in the past two years and also then to share how credit unions have fared over that period um so we'd also then like to illustrate how the maturity profile of credit union lending has changed in recent years um and in um that. Sorry, just give me one moment. Um, sorry, just a problem with my camera there. So, sorry, bear with me a moment there now. Um, that should uh, resolve that. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, how the profile of lending has changed or is and continues to change over recent years, um, and I suppose the term we're using there is uh, larger loans over longer terms. Um, and then we might also just touch on the uh, enhanced concentration limits and maybe just give you a little insight into the notifications, applications, uh, experience that we're, we're seeing there. Um, and finally, just some information sources. So if I maybe go to the next slide. Um, so to get a, um, a sense of the um, past 18 months, it's probably more illustrative to go back to 2016 um, as, as the run into it. So in around 2016, market growth in consumer lending resumed after a prolonged period of stagnation and contraction in the market, which would date right back to the resolution of the issues from the uh, the, the major crash in 2008-2009. So uh, this market 
uh, growth continued through to 2019, uh, after which the impact of COVID can be seen pretty directly there in terms of uh, lending, uh, lending contraction. Um, so existing personal facilities held up well in terms of repayments, um, and we would think this was helped quite a bit by uh, government uh, measures there in terms of state support for household incomes. But obviously, uh, the the, uh, the the contraction in demand for newer lending meant that the overall contraction, you know, uh, in market size uh, was pretty considerable. So if you look at the, at the higher point there of 13.9 billion in December 2019, uh, in June 2021, uh, this total figure had uh, uh, contracted to 11.3 billion, which is, you know, it, it, quite a contraction in terms of resizing at the market. When you think that all players in the market, be it banks or credit unions, are uh, fishing to a certain extent in 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 the same pot. So um, th that sort of shrinkage uh, gives you some idea of the ground that has to be made up there. So. Um, a point worth making here is probably that the, what constitutes the market is changing constantly. So as new forms of finance emerge and are quite uh, popular, such as PCP, uh, which has grown considerably in recent years, um, that would not be represented in these figures here. So it's it's more of a pure figure in relation to the traditional instalment type lending that credit unions primarily engage in uh, in the consumer market. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, just looking at credit union specifically, um, I think uh, you can see the credit union lending, while it uh, declined in the immediate aftermath of the onset of COVID, it has recovered to the extent that at June 2021, uh, total credit union consumer lending had recovered to September 2019 levels. So in comparative terms on the face of it, the sector appears to have suffered less than the overall market. So I would stress this is an aggregated picture and uh, we will talk about maybe individual entity performance uh, shortly. So the other point to make um, as we stand here in October, albeit without the benefit of September PR, is that uh, nominal lending growth is likely to have continued through the June to September quarter and that has been the experience uh, with the lifting of restrictions previously. So um, that, you know, that being the case, in the immediate uh, aftermath of that, we know historically that the final quarter is also traditionally uh, the strongest in terms of new loan originations for credit unions. So uh, it would be hoped that uh, the September figure would will be an improvement on the on the June one in terms of net growth. So um, just touch on the fact there, and I know we alluded to earlier there on forecasts and obviously the uncertainty. Uh, you will be aware of the from recent CBI and ESRI forecasts um, of a series of positive indicators for 2020 and beyond. Um, so how this impacts on consumer lending and obviously say specifically, uh, um, you know, credit union lending in, in your own case is, um, is probably remains to be seen. I mean, we've never encountered a situation like this and given that there's also been a huge buildup of household savings through the period uh, of the pandemic um, it's gone from the period from a, an amount of 102 billion to 124 billion there's quite an amount of accumulated savings which obviously you're well aware of yourselves um, so as the hopefully uh, economic conditions continue to improve, it's probably likely that there'll be a combination of increased demand for lending, but also then usage of existing savings. And, and I know that would obviously be welcome on the part of some credit unions who've have had to deal with the difficulties relating to uh, to the inflow on the savings side. So uh, maybe on the next slide, we'll just look at um, turning to, um, I suppose, individual credit union performance we've been talking about the aggregated picture which is obviously the 220 odd, odd credit unions that are um, so uh, as credit unions individual entries it's relevant to reflect on how they fare uh, individually so uh, this is a scatter diagram which gives an indication um, uh, by asset size and i suppose the yellow line across the middle uh, shows uh, the, really the, uh, the 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 resumption of growth you know in, in as, as at june 9 uh, sorry at june 20 uh, June 21, sorry, my, my index there is, is incorrect, but it's June 21, it's, that should be December 19 to, to June 21. So that yellow line uh, would show that 53% that, uh, of credit unions uh, were still below their December 2019 figure as at June uh, 2021, whilst 47% had achieved a return to positive growth. So uh, the spread is quite marked, as you can see there, and um, it, it doesn't uh, really distinguish between credit union by asset size. Um, and 
you know, obviously, I think, you know, intuitively, it's going to be impacted by common bond attributes like uh, location, uh, size of common bond, be it uh, geographical or community uh, credit unions versus industrial. So, um, you know, it would be our expectation, as I mentioned there, that quite a few more will move back into positive territory um, in, in, the, uh, in the final quarter of the year. And, th and that would be welcome, obviously. Um, the uplift that we if we have to feel may occur in 2021, 22. Um, again, I suppose it's shrouded by the fact that we, we, we're living in such uncertain times and we can't automatically assume that uh, a resumption of normal activity is going to translate into increased demand for lending. Um, so um, the final point to make there, I suppose, is that the LTA, the COVID shock, has not helped the LTA position uh, uh, by any means, by virtue of the shrinkage in demand, but also by the inflow of savings. So uh, with that, I, I referred to the very uh, large buildup in household deposits, of, of which credit unions are more than well aware. So um, it goes without saying that lending growth remains critical um, and uh, uh, to overall uh, vi viability and sustainability going forward. So I think that, uh, that will remain to be the case. So it, it's absolutely critical um so moving on to the next slide um i thought it'd be useful to as i said there to look at the changing profile and again going back to 2016 looking over the five-year period um it's notable that larger loans over longer terms is an increasing feature of credit union lending portfolios um so the maturity uh, uh, of loans uh, at origination greater than greater than five years but also uh the decline in lending for terms under three years, you know, as credit unions are so increasingly less involved in smaller loans over a very short time frame. So um, th this change in profile had already commenced prior to the change in, in lending regulations. So um, and to date, it hasn't been unduly influenced by any material increase in house lending or other secured lending greater than 10 years in maturity. So house lending, uh, you know, as I point out there, it remains the preserve of a relatively small number of credit unions. Um, as you can see from the numbers there involved to any degree in, in the provision of house loans. Uh, and likewise with business loans, albeit a higher proportion of credit unions are active in, in providing business loans. So um, as we have, have made the point previously, we would emphasize that engaging in longer term lending, and by this we mean greater than five years uh, at origination, whether it's secured or unsecured, it brings with it a range of additional risks uh, compared to the traditional credit union model. And there is guidance available and we've referred to it there. And obviously people can, can uh, click through uh, on the base when the slides are issued. Um, and we think that th those are important factors to uh, consider as that profile continues to uh, emerge over the over coming uh, periods. So uh, we will have much uh, more up-to-date information uh, come the financial conditions um, uh, um, publication, which would typically be uh, around late November, December period. And uh, we would recommend that obviously um, in terms of you being able to look at your own peer group and also then to look at the sector uh, performance overall under key performance indicators. So uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we just touch here on the new lending uh, concentration limits. Um, you know, as you'd be aware, um, these have been in place for almost two years. So in short, there is no uh, restriction now on unsecured lending um, uh, in that period up to 10 years, um, whilst house and commercial lending are now determined as a proportion of total assets, whereas previously longer term lending was determined as a proportion of overall lending. So this does afford credit unions the opportunity to develop their lending models uh, and to diversify as appropriate, uh, be it into the house or the SME sector. So we're now beginning to see credit unions coming forward with notifications and applications, and I've shown the numbers there, um, albeit the numbers are, are relatively small, which is, is not surprising, I suppose, given that a high proportion of credit unions would have significant additional capacity by virtue of the change in the uh, the, the denominator and, and and the measure, uh, but also then due to the experience in the past uh, in the past eighteen uh, to twenty months, um, you, you know you think it's probably a difficult time to be considering moving into new areas, um, given that obviously operational resilience and getting through the, the COVID has been obviously of of critical importance. And um, so again, we're using uh, today as a, an opportunity to remind. Um, 
credit unions of uh, notifications and uh, applications must be submitted through the Central Bank of Ireland portal. Uh, you'll be aware of that. I know there's performance issues with that, which hopefully will be resolved satisfactorily. Uh, we would always um, recommend uh, um, sort of early dialogue anyway, even a notification uh, informally to uh, supervisors in relation to uh, uh, matters such as this so that we're, we're on notice. Um, and I suppose the numbers there, as we mentioned, are small. We are aware of some more that are in in uh, pipeline and in preparation. And again, through the dialogue, through being informed by um, uh, by, uh, by our supervisors, um, uh, you know, having had conversations with it, and we're always open to that. Um, and I've just pointed there to some other uh, central bank resources on lending. So um, finally, really, um, just like to look at maybe the um, or just point out. Um, uh, Really, the, just the sources of information today that are, you know, there's a rich amount of information there, hopefully, and guidance under a variety of topics, including business model, long term lending, um, the um, even in the in the new concentration limits, uh, should have mentioned there that there's a new updated frequently asked questions um, um, uh, publication, which will be up on the website by the end of this week. And uh, again, you'll be you'll have access to that directly through the through the uh, information when, once the slides are distributed. Um, so um, that's really all I have to say on the learning model at this stage. Hopefully, you found it of interest. Um, I'll try and answer any questions or observations you might have in relation to to lending and i'd be happy to do that um so with that i'm going to hand back to i'm not sure whether i'm going back directly to elaine or whether david who i know is uh, facilitating um uh, the uh, q a there so um david or elaine <laughs>